you, say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get back into our Father's Word. The 18th chapter of Ezekiel, I find it fascinating for a very special reason. Probably one of the most often asked questions that I receive is, because I did so and so, is that why my child has this, that, or the other? Or is God punishing my children because of what I have done? And God addresses specifically, there are other places in God's Word that He addresses it, but specifically in this 18th chapter, He says, What is this thing that goes around among my children where you ask or say the child is punished for what the parents did? Or a child will say, we are being punished for what our parents did, meaning sin. And God said, I'm going to give you the answer. I'm going to see that you have no occasion to ask this anymore. I'm going to make it real plain. And then he explains in the fourth verse of the 18th chapter, which we stopped on in the last lecture, all souls are mine. In other words, you answer yourself as an individual to God. And God owns your soul, whether you like it or not. That's, it's too late to worry about that because he created your soul. He is the father of it. And inasmuch as the discussion is, does a father's sins or goodness change the child, we couldn't ask for a better heavenly father we should be affected to the point that it leaves us all in righteousness. But it doesn't work that way because of biblical illiteracy, because people are, do not understand the word. But after all is said and done in the fourth verse, all souls are mine. He created them. Your own child's soul is not yours. God loans you that child for a while. And... Uh, he continues on then, he will use three generations to make it very clear as to whether the sins can fall on one or the other, and then in his loving way, he will weave into that his answer as to whether he will even answer the question, does he want to see people be destroyed or die, meaning a spiritual death, meaning the second death, as described in Revelation chapter 20. And, of course, the answer is that he does not. Okay, now, with that in mind, chapter 18, verse 5, the question being, does a parent's sins fall off on children? God will answer it for you. Verse 5, and it reads, But if a man be just, if, he, if he's fair, if he justifies what he does by God's word, and do that which is lawful and right. Now, just because the word Israel is used here, this word man is not Adam, of which all Israelites are Adamics. The Hebrew word is alif, eh, va, shvin, which is to say ish, meaning it can be anyone. It's all of God's children. So, thus, it applies to you. If I don't care what race, color, creed, or tribe you belong to. If you are just, if you do that which is lawful and right, verse 6, and hath not eaten upon the mountains, that means participated in idol worship in high places, neither hath lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, Neither hath defiled his neighbor's wife, neither hath come near to a minstress woman, verse 7, and hath not oppressed any, but hath restored to the debtor his pledge, hath spoiled none by violence, has not misled anyone, hath given his bread to the hungry, and hath covered the naked with a garment. In other words, we can see that this is a very good man. Now, unfortunately, we're going to have described to us an almost perfect man. This would be a perfect man. We all fall short occasionally in one of those qualities or the other. 
It's just, it just happens when you live in a flesh body. But we see a person here that is a very good person, and we're not finished with his qualifications yet, but he is a very good man. A very good man. Verse 8. He that hath not given forth unto usury, in other words, he doesn't charge his brother interest on monies, neither hath taken any increase. He doesn't make over what is expected as profit that hath withdrawn his hand from iniquity. He tries to not sin, hath executed true judgment between man and man. In other words, as a follower of God, sometimes you're going to be called on as an arbitrator. And an arbitrator must know God's word and law and that that is right. And that's the way Christians are supposed to settle their differences. And unfortunately, many Christians uh, will not do that that is required by law to recover uh, lost uh, cost because the other man claims to be a Christian. If he's, if he's uh, beating you out of money, he's not a Christian. All right? You can do with him as you please. He's not a Christian. He only claims to be. You, why do I say that? Well, you've got to use a little common sense. What does it mean to cover the naked with a garment? Our righteous acts, which are being described here, are the material they, that uh, we wear as white raiment in the spiritual body. And you can find that written in Revelation chapter 19. And those righteous garments, you're supposed to share enough truth, plant enough seeds that you cover people with the gospel armor and even that cut of cloth. Verse 9, hath walked in my statutes and hath kept my judgments to deal truly. He is just, he shall surely live. He's going to live. That We're talking about eternal life here saith the Lord God. Now, I'll tell you, we again, God is giving you an example, the subject being, do children pay for the sins of their parents or vice versa? I mean, God has given us an analogy of an almost perfect man. You're not going to run across too many men that are that perfect, and don't let that disappoint you. Thank God for repentance, all right? Now, we're going to go on to another generation. Verse 10. If he begat a son that is a robber, a shedder of blood, that means he beats people or murders them, and that doeth the like to any one of these things. In other words, we can tell we got a, we got a bad child. Verse 11. And that doeth not any of those duties but even hath eaten upon the mountains. He's worshipped traditions of men that have crept into so-called churches. That is to say, uh, worship things that are not in the statute of God, statute and commandments of God, and defiled his neighbor's wife. In other words, he's breaking every law, every ordinance of the book. Twelve. Hath oppressed the poor and needy, rips them off, has spoiled by violence, hath not restored the pledge. If you ever loan him anything, you're not going to get it back. That's what that means. We can see that we're going to the extreme, and we're just, God is describing here, I mean, a no good um, dink, all right? And hath lifted up his eyes to the idols, hath committed abomination. And God considers all of these an abomination. Not the abomination of the desolator, but an abomination. 13. Hath given forth upon usury. You're, not gonna, you're sure not going to get a loan from him without paying a shark's interest rate on it. And hath taken increase. He will, he will charge an unreasonable fee for his services. Shall he then live? Question. Now, you're supposed to be able to understand that, hey, I mean, we know there's only one place this dude's headed for. He's no good. We wouldn't want a person like this in heaven. 
that's going to be for an eternity. You sure wouldn't want a person described like this to live eternally then, right? Of course. It isn't that you would wish him dead, but it, it, he sets his own precedent. And that's going to be the point of this lecture. God judges each individual on his own personal merit. He shall not live. He hath done all these abominations. He shall surely die. His blood shall be upon him. Now, not his father, not anyone else, but himself. His blood is on his own hands. That's why you hear me say so many times, I don't care what you do, that's up to you. The word lets us know what happens to you if you do certain things because your soul belongs to God. He knows, and you will see before we finish the chapter, that we're not perfect. But as long as you try, he will help you. Your soul is his, and he did not create it because he likes to zap people into the lake of fire. So uh, we have now discuss two of those three generations. The first generation, he was a good man, a, a very good man. There would be very few of us that could live up to his standards. And then he begats, or his wife gives birth to about the honoriest critter that you could ever want to describe, broke every rule in the book. Verse 14. Now, lo, if he begat, if this scoundrel, this low life, if he begat a son that seeth all his father's sins, which he hath done, and considereth, he thinks on this, he observes, meditates, and doeth, um, and doeth no such like, and, uh, do, and doeth not such like. In other words, he's... He can see that what his father does, and quite frankly, many of you, if you have a little gray hair on your head, you've experienced in life where a lot of times you can have a no good uh, cheapskate, scoundrel, that just is everything but an asset to the community. And some of his little old kids, when they see what that old man does, will turn out, they want to be as far away from him and unlike him as they can be. And they turn out to be excellent children. So I can kind of relate to this in, in my experience in watching people grow up. Uh, so it is not unusual that God would say, in as much as he created our minds, he knows how they work, that a child considers and thinks how stupid his uh, father reacts, and yet at the same time a respectful child, but when he grows into manhood, he sets a little different um, life for himself. Verse 15, we're in the third generation now. He doesn't do like his dad, that was the scoundrel. 15, that hath not eaten upon the mountains. He wouldn't worship anything but the living God. Neither hath lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel. He wouldn't let traditions of men swing him out of the path of God. Hath not defiled his neighbor's wife. And again, we can see that this grandson, he's a good old boy. He's a lot like his granddad rather than his scoundrelly father. Verse 16. Neither hath oppressed any. To oppress someone is to catch somebody in a bad position and just really rip them off good, force them into things that they have no choice about. Hath not withholden the pledge. In other words, he keeps his word. This boy does. His dad, hey, if he gave you a pledge, forget it. Neither has spoiled by violence the peaceful living boy but hath given his bread to the hungry, that that he could spare, he, he shared with the, uh, those in poverty, and hath covered the naked with a garment. That is to say, he was very good and just 
in all people that he dealt with. Verse 17, that hath taken off his hand from the poor. Many people put their hand on the poor and rip them off. They really do. That hath not received usury nor increase. In other words, he does fairly in all his business dealings hath executed my judgments, hath walked in my statutes, he shall not die for the iniquity of his father, he shall surely live. So here you have three situations. <clears throat> you have the grandfather, he was good. You have the father, couldn't have been any worse, maybe. And then a son who was good, just, and serve God. And naturally, if I asked you, is he going to live? Your answer would be, of course, this one is going to live. Inasmuch, and each time usury comes up, usury is interest charged on money. Um, a Christian should not charge his brother interest, but you have to realize there is a difference between brother and neighbor, all right? And a brother is, uh, well, born of the same womb. And naturally in business, you can't, uh, it was not unfair as long as the increase was justifiable. All right? Fair and just, in other words. Uh, I just throw that in because some people, they'll read, so you're not supposed to charge interest. No, to your own brother. All right? Verse 18. As for his father, this was the bad one, because he cruelly oppressed, spoiled his brother by violence, and did that which is not good among his people, lo, even he shall die in his iniquity. He's going to die in his sin. He's not going to um, live in the eternity. And that's what the eternity is about, basically, is to get rid of those people that don't fit, those people that mess up. In other words, somebody that does not choose to love our Father to the point that in loving Him, they follow His Word, they don't belong with us, all right? Just don't belong with us. Okay, verse 19. Yet say ye, why? Question. Now, understand. Don't take your mind away from the question that God is answering. Does a child pay for the sins of the father? Answer, no. He's, that's what he is teaching you here. Verse 19, why? Question. Doth not the son bear the iniquity of the father? Question. Here, and here we have it. When the son hath done that which is lawful and right, and hath kept all my statutes, this is God's ruling, and hath done them, he shall surely live. This son is not going to pay for the sins of the father. No way. God is always fair, and if you think for one moment ever that you find God in a very unfair situation, forget it. You don't understand what the word is talking about. Because God is always fair and just on an independent, individual um, judgment. Always. Verse 20. The soul that sinneth. This would be the second generation. It shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Now, God has answered in a very clear tone there. The sins of a father are never answered for by his parents or his children. He answers for his own sins in the way that God chooses on an individual basis. And his child will answer for his sins on an individual basis. Now we have a lot of old tales that circulate about 
if the woman is frightened by a wolf, uh, and I'm, this is, I'm making this up as I go along, the child will be born with a veil and bark like a dog on a bright moonlight night, all right? Now, now get rid of all that stuff. I don't care what the mother is frightened by. Unless she's injured, it does not hurt the child. And there is no birthmark or anything else that is not natural or is caused by something a mother did as long as she eats healthy and so forth. What I'm trying to say is don't let some religious uh, person that is ignorant of God's word put you on some guilt trip about it's your fault that this child is this way. Now, there are exceptions to this in this generation. If you... If you're a user of crack and the child is maimed, yeah, you're responsible. But don't worry, God will take care of that also. That is simply ignorance coming out the gate that while you were pregnant, you were using something that is poison and killed the child, crippled it for life, all right? Can happen, does happen every day. Don't kid yourself. But... I'm talking about the sins themselves, as long as they are not sins that pertain to help. Uh, there is no witchcraft put upon the parent that's going to, and it's almost the same as witchcraft if you say what the mother did or was frightened by shaped the life of the child. It's nonsense. The mother will answer for her sins. The child will answer for its sins. End of question. God's own decision. And it is fair, and it is just. Verse 21. But if the wicked will turn from all his sins, you take this father that was really a mess. If he turn from his sins that he hath committed, and keep all my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. How about that? In other words... Our Father frees him. Our Father finds him innocent. On what? Repentance. Do you see how much your Father loves you? And you'd better be thankful for that. Because not one of us, and I mean, I'll say it again, not one of us are as perfect as that first generation and the second. That is to say, does not break one. I mean, not one law and is totally fair and just in all things. We just accidentally mess up more than that, all right? But thanks be to our Father, even that scoundrel that broke every, and now listen to me, broke every law in the book on repentance, God says, I forgive him. Now, a lot of people won't do that, but God forgives, all right? Now, um, verse 22. All his transgressions that he hath committed, every last one of those sins, that he broke every rule in the book, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. In other words, the granddad... His righteousness let him have life. This scoundrel that broke every law in the book, when he turned to righteous, repent, righteousness, when he repented, and that simply means he started acting right. He repented to the Father and said, I'm sorry. In other words, God, don't forget, God owns that soul. It is not God's pleasure to destroy anyone's soul. I mean, that's it, blotted out. And when we repent, we, sal he, we salvage or he salvages one of his own children and says, child, you have done well. Therefore, our father is well. We see the love that he has instilled within us through the son and we see that our Father sets in this generation uh, an example that man cannot match. Each one of us is responsible, to to responsible totally and completely for our own sins. 
But our Heavenly Father loves us so much that Emmanuel, God with us, came from above and paid a price for us, for our sins, whereby when we repent, those sins are removed and I repeat, are not even mentioned. I mean, this guy lived a life that I, I, I really can't imagine anyone being that bad to break every book of both civil, religious, and otherwise. All of them. Every commandment and every law. And yet, when he went to our Father and repented, he was forgiven. Now, many might say, well, Christ hadn't died on the cross. No, I said in this generation, we can easily see the great love that our Father has for his souls, that is to say, the souls of his children, how that he appreciates them, and how very fortunate we are. And, quite frankly, you should rejoice when one that is bad repents and changes. Do you know why? Because even the angels in heaven rejoice when that happens. Our Father rejoices. And we see that man, with some help and some guidance, is not that bad. It was just a frame of mind, a set of circumstances, don't care attitude. And when you realize the love of our Father for his children, it can dampen a bad attitude very quickly. When we compare our compassion with the compassion of our Father. All right, let's go on to the next verse at this time. Verse 23. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die? Question. Think about it. Do you think God has pleasure when he gets to zap somebody that's wicked? Question. Say it the Lord God. And not that he should return from his ways and live? Question. Well, you can answer that for yourself in, in 2 Peter chapter 3, I believe it's verse 9, I think, where it, where it is written, God is long-suffering, and it is his will, he hopes, that all come to repentance. He doesn't want to zap anybody, but he will. But he gets no pleasure from it. And that's really very simple. We find in the very last verse of the fourth chapter of Revelation that God created all things for his pleasure. He wants to be happy, not sad. And I'm, I go right along with him. I want to be happy, and I want sad sacks removed from this earth. I'm ready, all right? And that's what's going to happen. Verse 24, But when the righteousness turned away from his righteousness and committed iniquity and committeth iniquity, and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? Question. In other words, this old boy has lived a perfect life. Let's say old grandpa. Grandpa was perfect, I mean, just all of his life. And all of a sudden, he just threw all that to one side and started breaking every rule in the book. Is he going to live? I mean, he was a righteous man most of his life. Continuing, all his righteousness that he hath done, listen carefully, shall not be mentioned. That's the equivalent of the guy, bad guy's sins. They weren't mentioned to him when he turned righteous. In his trespass, that he hath trespassed, and in his sin that he hath sinned, both civil and religious, spiritual, better said, in them shall he die. Now, we have some of these people that like to say, yeah, but once saved, always saved. Oh, I'd be very careful in handling that because every sin that you have not repented of, you're going to answer for. And I'm not the judge, God is. But he makes it very clear here 
that he does not want to zap anyone. Maybe that's a crude term to use, but I'm going to use it nevertheless. But if you force him to, if the scales tips the other way on you, I don't care how long you were a perfect little angel. Zap, my friend. If you don't love our Father enough to know that he loved you so much that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever, whomever, wherever, should believe upon him, ish, anyone, then that anyone that would believe upon him with repentance should never die, never perish, but have everlasting life. <clears throat> I don't think we want anyone around that is not quite uh, full of love enough to know that they can taste that very act and realize when we're wrong, say I'm sorry, I have a change of heart, and repent of it. For once a man knows what is right, and then begins breaking every rule in the book without repenting, deserves to die. Above all people, that one should have known better, all right? So be very careful, my friend. The judge is coming, and the judge is our father. <clears throat> if you want none of your good deeds mentioned, just be a breaker of every law in the book with a I don't care attitude, because God, it does not please our father. Verse 25, yet ye say, this is what you all say, the way of the Lord is not equal. Hear now, O house of Israel. Is not my way equal? Question. Are not your ways unequal? Isn't it you that's unequal? Well, the man was good all of his life. He worked hard. And God sent him to hell. Well, look what he did. He ended up knowing better. Broke every rule in the book. 26. When a righteous man turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity, sin, and dieth in them for his iniquity, not somebody else's, not his sons, not his grandfathers, but for his iniquity that he hath done, shall he die. Again, not the father, not the son, not somebody else, not the lawyer, his own. 27. Again. When the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness that he hath committed, and doth that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive. So you see, though we have salvation paid for by Jesus Christ, you still, when your soul is saved, it is you that save it on the price that he paid. Your mother cannot do it for you. Your father cannot do it for you. Your children cannot do it for you. You're on your own. And you answer for yourself. 28. Because he considereth and turneth away from all his transgressions that he hath committed, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Turned out to be a good old boy. Loved the father. And I hope that you understand. Love counts for a lot with our father. Quite frankly, everything. Loving him, trying and obeying. 29, I'm going to finish this chapter. Yet saith the house of Israel, this is what the people say, the way of the Lord is not equal. And God answers back, O house of Israel, are not my ways equal? Question. Are not your ways unequal? Question. Listen carefully, 30. Therefore I will judge you. I'm going to tell you something. Your preacher is not going to judge you. Uh, he might do some judging, but it doesn't amount to a hill of beans. Your father is not going to be able to judge you, nor are your children. But God will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his, I repeat, his individual, his ways, saith the Lord God. What do you do? Repent and turn yourself. From all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. You set your own prize, friend. You set your own gate. You make your own bed, and you're going to sleep in it. 
It may be flowers, it may be roses, but you make your own bed and you're going to sleep it. 31, win, lose, or draw, friend. 31, cast away from you all your transgression. Stop it. Whereby ye have transgressed and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die? God says, I don't want to see you die, O house of Israel. To conclude, 32. For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth. It's his own child. Saith the Lord God, wherefore turn yourselves and live ye. I do not understand why anyone wouldn't. Yes, we're not perfect but I don't know too many people that break every rule in the book. There's good in everyone, and that's what your father wants you to know. But most of all, he does not want you to die the eternal death. He wants you to live. Well, why would he want that? He loves you. And he made it possible through the crucifixion that you can walk in the shadow of that cross, or the light, I should say, I dislike that choice of analogy, in the light of He that showed us how to really love and forgiveness and an example set forth. So, answer to the question, is God fair? Answer, yes. Do your children for any way, reason, pay for your sins? Answer, absolutely not. God allows each individual to set his own destiny. Destinies are set by God's blessings. God blesses those that love him. God does not bless necessarily all that he loves because he loves everyone. He blesses those that return his love that serve him and never forget that little word repent because many times in judging ourselves I said in judging ourselves we're not really hard enough on ourselves and if God does the final judging that's the judge you want to please all right bless your heart you